Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to our final instalment of the St Mungo's Festival 2022. Over the last week and a bit, we have been taken on the most amazing journey. We started off with a lecture on the um, origins of the, the stories of St Mungo that we have become so familiar with. And we progressed from that to learning all about music in the age of St Mungo, and then had the amazing opportunity to witness the music being sung by the Strathclyde Chamber Choir. For those of you that joined us at the weekend, we had a fascinating discussion between Reverend Mark from Glasgow Cathedral, um, the St Mungo's Cathedral, and Gordon from one of the trustees of St Mungo's, um, uh, sorry, Medieval Glasgow Trust, who shared with us their fascinating insights into the secret signs and symbols of the cathedral. From there, we had a beautiful ecumenical service from uh, Glasgow Cathedral. And today we bring our festival to a close, not with St Mungo, but with our other national saint, if you like, or the man who could have been our national saint, St Columba. We are joined tonight by Gilbert Marcus. Gilbert Marcus is a leading scholar at the University of Glasgow in Celtic in Gaelic, and he is going to explore the uses of a saint. And I was thinking about the uses of a saint and what's it, what uses St Columba has been put to, and we find him in all the place names and in so much of our national identity. But what I think is really interesting is that it was his banishing of the water beast that formed, shall we say, the cult of Nessie. But to tell us more about it and to embrace um, his um, uh, the uses of a saint, can I ask Gilbert Marcus to join us in celebrating 1500 years of St Columba. Good evening. I'd like to begin by thanking the organisers of the St Mungo Festival for the invitation to speak this evening. It's a pleasure to address you all, though it would have been an even greater pleasure had COVID circumstances allowed me to address you face to face and perhaps to go to the pub afterwards. But as well as thanking the organisers, I'd like to apologise, not to the organisers or to you, the audience, but I really do have to apologise to St Mungo or Kentigern as he is more formally known, because I'm giving a talk as part of his festival, organised by people in St Mungo's city of Glasgow. And instead of talking about him or about Glasgow, I'm talking about St Columba and the island of Iona. And I'm slightly alarmed, I must say, by the words of Gerald of Wales in the 12th century, who says that the British and Irish are more prone to anger and revenge than any other nations, and the saints of those countries also appear to be of a more vindictive nature. So I'm hoping that Mungo won't take offence vindictively at my diverting your attention from himself and his church, the ancient British Church of Glasgow, to talk about Columba and his ancient Gallic church on Iona. Perhaps Mungo will forgive me, because in the 12th century life of Kentigern by Jocelyn, Jocelyn says that he and Columba met and became friends. Here they are represented together in a window in the old parish church of Kilmacombe. But more seriously, Jocelyn's life of Kentigern is a good illustration of a process which I'm going to talk about this evening. It's a process which I will call colonial church foundation. What do I mean by that phrase, colonial church foundation? It's something that happens when one medieval kingdom or polity conquers another, takes control of its territory, exercises overlordship, colonizes it in other words, and makes it pay tribute of some sort, 
But part of that process of domination or colonization is the foundation of churches. Churches that the conqueror founds and controls in the territory over which he has seized power. And this is what happened in the case of Glasgow. During the 12th century, the, the kings of Scotia, properly speaking, the territory north of the Forth, were extending and consolidating their hold of what had once been the Kingdom of Strathclyde, usually referred to as Cumbria in Latin sources of the period. This aggressive southward Scottish expansion is the context for the foundation of Glasgow Cathedral. The Kings of Scots founded their church and promoted their bishop, Kentigern, in Glasgow and suppressed the ancient church of Govan, which most likely had formerly been the principal royal church of the older British Kingdom. The suppression of Govan also meant the suppression of the cult of St. Constantine, who was celebrated there. And so Kentigern was promoted in the 12th century as the great patron saint of Cumbria. And St. Kentigern's supposed successors, the Bishop of Glasgow, were the new potentates of the region. And it's not only St. Constantine of Govan that is suppressed in this way. There's another interesting aspect to Jocelyn's life of Kentigern, which is how he rewrites the history of the conversion to Christianity. The story that Jocelyn had inherited was basically the story told by Bede in the 8th century. Bede says that the Northern Picts were converted to Christianity by Columba of Iona, and the Southern Picts were converted by St Ninian, the Bishop of Whithorn. So that was the story that Jocelyn had inherited. But while he basically repeats Bede's story, Jocelyn goes on to completely undermine it by adding a new story of his own. Yes, he says, Ninian and Columba had a role in converting the Picts, but he adds Kentigern to Bede's account of the initial conversion. And then, and this is the most dramatic rewriting, he says that the Picts and Scots and innumerable other people in various parts of Britain lapsed into apostasy. They ceased to be Christians. And after that, it was Kentigern and Kentigern alone who brought them back to the faith. In other words, the true apostle of the Picts and Scots, and of many Britons, for Jocelyn, was not Columba or Ninian at all. They had preached, Jocelyn says, acknowledging Bede, but their preaching had failed. The true apostle of all these people was now Kentigern. He is the one who brought about the definitive conversion. And that means that his church in Glasgow is the true apostolic church of the region, the church with authority, not Constantine's Govan, not Columba's Iona, not Ninian's Whithorn. Glasgow is presented by Jocelyn in the 12th century as the chief of churches in this territory, in the ever-expanding kingdom of the Scots. So that's what I mean by a colonial church foundation. It's a perspective that sees a church's foundation in the context of secular politics and corresponding ecclesiastical authority. And it can be manifested, as we've seen in the story about Columba and Ninian alongside Kentigern, it can be manifested in stories about saints who serve as historical or legendary representatives of competing political forces when the stories were written. So let's turn our attention now to Iona with the forgiveness of St Mungo. 
and its foundation by St. Columba in the 6th century. And let's think about this island monastery in a similar sort of way. What was the political context of its foundation? Columba's arrival on Iona in 563 has attracted a lot of rather different interpretations. There is, of course, the splendid story about him secretly making a copy of St. Finian's book, and Finian demanding the return of both his own original book and Columba's unlawfully made copy, and the dispute between the two saints as a result, and the battle that ensued from the dispute, which, according to the legend, resulted in Columba, because of his involvement in the battle, having to leave Ireland and go into perpetual exile in Britain to Iona, never to return to Ireland again. Well, it's a great story, but unfortunately there is really no reason for us to believe any of it. The story about copying the book, the battle, and Columba's exile to Britain first appears in Manus O'Donnell's Life of Columba, written almost a thousand years after the events it describes. It sheds no light on Columba's voyage to Iona at all, nor on his reasons for going there. A much better guide to understanding Columba's voyage is the life of Columba by Adavnon. Adavnon was the ninth abbot of Iona, Columba's successor, ruling the monastery only decades after Columba himself. For Adavnon, Columba's voyage to Britain was not an exile imposed for some supposed crime. It was his monastic vocation, the urge to be an exile for Christ, pro Christo peregrinari, to abandon status and security and to live the ascetic life, a life of community, prayer, study and simplicity. But there was more to it than this. There was a political dimension too, which I now want to explore. To do so, we'll have to look at the political situation in the 560s, at the time of Columba's journey. We can start by reminding ourselves of the political world that Columba lived in the multiple layers of small kingdoms and over kingdoms and super kingdoms that constituted Irish society. Columba, or Colum Killer, was a member of the Northern Irish kindred of the Kennel Connell, up there in the northwest, that is, the descendants of Connell, one of the ruling kindreds that made up the Northern Iñel. Columba was, in fact, himself, the great-grandson of Connell, the man who had given his name to Kennel Connell. Now, in the year 561, two years before Columba's voyage to Iona, the northern Iñel were ambitious for power, posing a threat to Diarmuid Macarbel of the southern Iñel, who at that time held the so-called High Kingship of Ireland the kingship of Tara. The Battle of Kuldrevna in that year was fought apparently as an attempt by Jermut to suppress, to, to suppress sorry, that northern Iñel challenge to his southern power. Jermut was defeated by the combined forces of the northerners, the Kennel Connell and the Kennel Yoin, but he survived the battle and hung on to power until his death in 564. But when he died, Forgus and Donal of Kennel Yoin took the kingship of Tara and lasted only a year. And they were followed by Anmara of Kennel Connell, who ruled for three years, and then Aed Anmara that's Aeth's son, 
ruled for the next 12 years. Ken O'Connell are in control for most of Columbus' abbacy of Iona. So during the period of Columbus voyage to Iona, we see the rapid expansion of Northern Inel power. And for most of that time, it was the Kennel Connell who held the kingship of Tara. Anmara, one of the victors at the Battle of Kuldrevna, was Columbus' first cousin. Now Columbus' Kennel Connell kindred were not only expanding their power into the south, claiming the kingship of Tara. In 563, they fought a battle at a place called Mon Dara Lotha. Here they were taking sides in an internal conflict within the Kruthin people, a name that refers to dynasties in what is shown to the east of the Inyel on this map. Uh, in the northern part of the province of Ulef, or Ulster. Now, the Kennel, the Kennel Connell, the Inyel, at this point were supporting one side against another in an internal dispute within the Cruithen. And in return for their support for the winning side, they were able to expand their territory eastward acquiring the lands of Lee and Ard Yolark, which are the two red stars on the map. Given the location of those two lands, just to the west of the territory of Dalriata, marked on this map, we can guess that they were probably carved out of Dalriata territory. The Dalriata were perhaps the losing side on this, in this internal battle among the Cruthen. Now, the year of that battle was the very year that Columbus sailed to Iona. As his kinsmen were taking over parts of Dalrieta territory in Ireland, the two red stars at the bottom of this map, Columba was sailing across to Britain and building a monastery in Dalrieta territory on Iona. Remember that Dalrieta is a single but bipartite kingdom straddling the sea between Ireland and Britain. So as the Inyel are expanding in Ireland and taking over Dalrieta there, they also establish a monastery on the British side of the water, also in Dalrieta territory. And Columbus monks not only took possession of the whole island of Iona, they also acquired, either immediately or shortly afterwards, possessions and rights in Ardnamurchen, Lochaber, Mal, Locho, Tyree, and possibly even on Skye, all of which are discussed by Adamnorn in his 7th century life of Columba. Well, you might think to yourself, it's very nice of the Inyel to build a monastery for the Dalrieta folk on Iona. Very kind of them to create such a spiritual and pastoral resource for those Dalrieta people. But what the Inyel monks are doing is taking over land and resources. They didn't build a monastery and leave it for those nice Dalrieta people. They built a monastery and retained control of it, and of its lands, and of its revenues. And for over a century, almost all the abbots, not quite all, but almost all the abbots, were members of the Kennel Connell, as you can see on this family tree where the abbots are numbered in red. The foundation of a monastery on Iona involved planting a hugely important institution in somebody else's territory which would have a great ideological impact on the Dalrieta people. The Kennel Connell would retain control of the monastery, acquiring lands and revenues from their territory, 
which would now be under the control of a Kennel Connell abbot, thereby depriving Dalriata lords of some of their lands and revenues. It's another colonial church foundation. So far, I've been treating the kingdom of Dalriata as a single polity, under pressure from the more powerful Inyel to the west. But we have to remember that kingship in the Gallic world was a multi-layered affair. Within the kingdom of Dalriata, there were four distinct kindreds or kenele, each with their own territory, and each of them struggling for power over the other three. Kenel Lorne in the north, which is the area where Iona lies, Kenel Ungesa in Isla, Kenel Gavrain in Kintyre, and Kenel Kovgal in the southeast, in what is now the Cowell Peninsula. In fact, the name Cowell is simply the surviving modern pronunciation of Kovgal, the name of the ruling kindred in the 6th century. Now, when Columbus sailed from Ireland, he was given Iona by the king, Conal MacCovgal, Conal the son of Covgal, the king of that southeastern territory of Dalriata, in the Firth lands of the Clyde. But Conal, down in the southeast, gave Columba an island in the far northwest of Dalriata far beyond his own kindred's territory, in Kennel Lorne. This implies that Connell had acquired not just control of his own territory in the southeast, but over kingship of the whole of Dalriata. By giving away land in the north, in Kennel Lorne territory, Connell was asserting his kingship there, by exercising political and military muscle over a rival kindred. And importantly, he was weakening that rival kindred by giving lands in Kennel Lorne to the church, to Columba. He took those lands and the wealth they produced out of the hands of Kennel Lorne rulers and so weakened their economic and military position. So there's a real political power play going on in Connell's grant to Columba. It's another colonial foundation. You could also say, however, that by granting this island to St. Columba, Connell is adopting a slightly more gentle form of overlordship than he otherwise might. He might, for example, have seized territory from Kennel Lorne for himself and his own kindred. He might have demanded vast tribute in cattle and other wealth and forced Kennel Lorne to hand over hostages. Perhaps granting the island to the church was a way of asserting his overkingship without overdoing it, without provoking with unnecessary aggression his underking in Kennel Lorne by being too aggressive himself. So, I would suggest that this helps us to understand what Columbus' journey to Iona was about. I've already argued that there is no reason to believe the story about the copying of the book, or Columba being blamed for the Battle of Kuldrevna, a story which doesn't appear until the 16th century. And I think we can also rule out the notion that sometimes discussed that Columba came as a missionary preacher, hoping to convert the people of Dalriata to Christianity. He came from a Gallic-speaking Christian Ireland to a Gallic-speaking Christian Dalriata. They were already Christian when he got here. Connell was a Christian, that's why he gave him an island for a monastery. In terms of Columba's motivation then, we're left with two stories. Why did he come to Iona? For Adamnon, he wanted to be a pilgrim for Christ, a peregrinus, one who leaves their home territory, 
the place where they have legal standing and protection, the place where they have security of kindred and status, and went to live as a stranger. And there's certainly some truth in that. Columba left behind his homeland and his kennel connell kindred up to a point to live in a foreign land. But he also remained a member of that kindred, and that was important to him. His journey to Iona was not just a departure from them. It was also a way of extending the authority and power of his kindred into a new territory. It was an act of colonial expansion on behalf of that kindred. And many of his fellow monks and most of his successors as abbot for over a century continued to be from that kindred. Iona was a family business, you might say. And far from being an exile in, from Ireland, um, Columba returned there at least once, possibly several times during his abbacy of Iona, once evidently to help negotiate a treaty between the, the Kennel Connell, his own kindred, and the kingdom of Dalrieta, which was apparently supposed to guarantee the permanent authority of the Iñel. So he returned to Ireland at least once as a high-level political negotiator on behalf of his family. Ascetic monk or political diplomat. Both stories can be completely true, of course. Columba did come as a monk to establish a place of common life and prayer and contemplation. And he was also part of the colonizing thrust of Kennel Connell dominance in Dalrieta. One does not exclude the other. Politics and the gospel are interwoven, always. Iona wasn't interested only in the political fortunes and kingship of the Kennel Connell. With the writings of Adavnon, the ninth abbot, we see that the monastery was concerned with reinventing kingship as such. They promoted the idea, an idea quite alien to native Gallic tradition, that the king was ordained by God. Adavnon writes about a man called Eidu, referring to him as a very bloody man who had killed many people, including Jermot Makerbol, ordained by God's will as king of all Ireland. That's a radically new idea, a king ordained by God's will, an idea with a biblical origin. Likewise, Adavnon refers to the Northumbrian king, Oswald, as ordained by God, as emperor of all Britain. Not only does Adavnon promote this new idea of the king as a divinely ordained figure, but he also portrays Columba as actually ordaining Aidan McGavrain as king of Dalrieta on Iona. And in this story, Columba ordains Aethan king specifically on God's command. The implication is clearly that the abbot of Iona has the power or the right to ordain kings, and whoever he ordains as king is the one chosen by God, God's anointed one. Adamnon describes Columba doing this. But he himself his Columba's successor. By implication, what Columba did once, Adavnon now has the right to do. Adavnon also makes the claim that kings would rise or fall according to Columba's will. He says that some kings were conquered in the terrifying crash of battle and others emerged victorious according to what Columba asked of God by the power of prayer. That central aspect of kingship, victory in battle, is something which Columba, the abbot of Iona, and therefore Adavnon, his successor, have the power to grant. 
Adabnon argues that even once you have been inaugurated as king, your survival, your success as king, and the success of your kingdom depends on your good standing with Columba and with Columba's successors. The fate of kings blessed or cursed by Columba plays a significant role throughout Adabnon's life. Many kings are cursed in the life of Columba for their violation of a relationship of trust with the saint. Kings in Adavnon's own time, therefore, are to be left in no doubt where they stand. They must honour Columba's successor, the abbot of Iona. This puts a rather different complexion on the relationship between Iona and the secular rulers of the 6th and 7th centuries. It's not just a matter of powerful kings using churches and monasteries to extend their power over subject territories, as you might think in the concept of a colonial church foundation. Bishops and the abbots of monasteries also had their own agenda, their own goals to pursue. Sometimes those goals were inspired by loyalty to family, or to kindred, or to some kingdom. But they were also inspired by what they thought were gospel values. One very important, important example of this is Adamnon's Law of the Innocents. In the year 697, Adamnon had been the abbot of Iona for about 18 years. He was at the height of his powers. A renowned and respected monk and scholar. But in addition to this, he was also the cousin of Longshach MacAngusser, the Kennel Connell king, who had become king of Tara, or king of all Ireland, as uh, the annals refer to him, um, two years earlier. So Adabnon was now in the most powerful possible position, and he used this position to promote a new law. Summoning a great gathering at Burr in the Irish Midlands of church and secular rulers, Adabnon promoted a law for the protection of non-combatants from violence. The abbot of Iona composed and promoted a law which introduced heavy fines for anyone who killed or injured churchmen or women or children, the three groups of people who did not bear weapons in early medieval society, who did not take part in warfare, and so in that sense were innocents, non-combatants. Secular rulers and church rulers from all over the Gallic-speaking world undertook to enforce Adamnon's law, as also did the king and bishop of the Picts in the northeast of Scotland. It was therefore a genuinely international law, formed by the support of distinct kingdoms and their churches, sharing a common objective and giving that common objective legal force. For a church ostensibly founded by a man seeking to be a simple pilgrim for Christ, seeking to withdraw from the world, this is an extraordinary political achievement, a moment in which a humble monk is exercising an enormous amount of political power. We are perhaps sometimes tempted to consider the church as one entity and kingdoms or society, the world, as another distinct entity. We tend to reify them, to treat them as two distinct historical objects of interest. But that's a mistake. The closely intertwined interests 
and objectives of kings and clergy, of ascetic monks and warlords, cannot be easily disentangled. The vision of the monk and the ambition of a powerful king are inextricably interlaced expressions of our history. Thank you. Thank you Oi. so thank you so much, Gilbert. That was absolutely fascinating. I have never heard it explained in, with such um, a phenomenal attention to what was happening in Ireland at the time. We often so focus in uh, within our geographic boundaries. Um, comments are coming in saying how enlightening uh, the talk was for all of us. Uh, we've got some time for some questions, if that's all right with you. Uh, so, first of all, um, we had a question from Susan O'Donnell, and it's actually a question I was thinking of myself. Could you explain a little bit about the context of several of the Scottish and Irish kings being buried on Iona, um, whether this was a tradition only for a short while or for longer, or what, what do you think motivates that? Um. <clears throat> The burial of kings on Iona is um, something that probably Iona would, would have encouraged. The idea of being a royal mausoleum in the early centuries would have been a very advantageous one to them. Um, and there is evidence in the early Middle Ages of one or two kings actually being buried there. It's even possible that the Northumbrian king, Edgefrith, who was killed in 685, um, was buried on Iona, taken from the battle where he fell uh, and buried on Iona shortly afterwards. Um, it's not absolutely certain, and the reference to that is sometime later, but uh, a martyrology mentions him as a saint, bizarrely, and this martyrology has its, as part of its original layers um, a martyrology which was composed on Iona. It's quite possible that this martyrology reflects a genuine Iona recollection mm -hmm. of a seventh century royal burial on Iona, mm -hmm. even though that royal burial was quite possibly the burial of a king who was regarded with a degree of hostility by the Iona monks. Um, but the story about the very regular burial of, of kings of Picts and kings of Dalrieta and Scottish kings is actually quite a late story. Um, it appears at a time when Scotland is redesigning its sense of itself um, after Malcolm Canmore's reign and Dunfermline is emerging as the new burial centre for the Scottish royal family. And it's perhaps told with partly with a view to distancing um, the new regime from um, an earlier pattern of, of politics, which mm -hmm. was symbolically associated with Iona. Um, the evidence for actual royal burials in the, the early Middle Ages and the High Middle Ages is actually very thin on the ground, mm -hmm. but it becomes a major um, theme of later writing about Iona mm -hmm. and of course in the later Middle Ages and beyond mm -hmm. lots of kings uh, and kings of the Isles uh, especially and rulers of of the of the, the Gaelic speaking kingdoms of the west coast really are buried on Iona and there are a great many um, uh, such royal and lordly burials and their monuments very very well recorded for the later period. It's fascinating. I wonder what it is that gives them um, some sense uh, that fascinating staying power. You know, when I think of uh, all the saints that um, uh, that we've had through Scottish history, why Saint Mungo, why Saint Columba, why Saint Ninian? You know, it's, a, it's an interesting one. My next question comes from Thomas Back that says, and I'll just read it to you if that's okay. To what extent was the shift from Govan and Constantine to Glasgow and St Mungo about the ecclesiastical independence from England? By the time of Jocelyn, the Kingdom of Strathclyde would have been a thing of the past, 
And I would have, I would have thought that the bishops of York, whoops, it's jumping in front of me. The bishops of York could have interpreted St Ninian as their predecessor, so justifying their supremacy over Scotland. Would you like me to repeat any of that? Yes. Um, no, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It would be hard for York to imagine mm -hmm. Ninian as their predecessor. Mm -hmm. um, Ninian's church was taken over by the Northumbrians in the seventh century. Mm -hmm. And so he is kind of co-opted, especially by Bede, into essentially a Northumbrian hegemony. Um, it's a, in some ways, it is almost like a kind of colonial church foundation. Um, Whithorn, the, the church, the Episcopal church, is allegedly of St. Ninian, only appears in the record um, after the Northumbrian takeover. So it's almost as if the, the whole story of Ninian and the, the hugely important church of Whithorn the mythology around it is a Northumbrian mythology, boosting the importance of a church which they are now in control of, and therefore supporting their political and ecclesiastical power in Southwest Scotland, what is now Southwest Scotland. Um, so um, you could see that as a, as a colonial foundation in some sense, if, if it wasn't actually a foundation, it was certainly a kind of amplification of an existing church for colonial purposes by the Northumbrians. Mm -hmm. And it would be hard to make sense from, from York's perspective of, of identifying Ninian as one of their great um, apical figures, if you like. So I don't think that would work. Um, I'm not quite sure, I can't remember now how the first part of the question went. I, I, I addressed the second part first. What was the first part? Let me go back to it. It's jumping in front of me. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry, no, it's, it's, it, it, they're, they're coming and going in front of me. Whilst, we, whilst I find it, could you perhaps give us um, an explanation of what the relationship was, if, if no one, between Columba and Pope Vigilis at the time? Um, absolutely none, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. um, there's no good evidence for Columba having any direct uh, connection to any Pope. Um, later legends do, um, as they almost always do, uh, try to, um, increase the impression of sanctity of a saint by associating them with some pope or other but I don't think there's any very any good uh, um, evidence for Columba having any connection directly with any pope at all. Mm. Um, what's interesting though that very shortly after Columba dies um, a man called Dallon Fergal uh, writes a, a poem probably within a year or two of his death in 597, writes a lovely and very opaque poem uh, about Columbus' sanctity and our need, it's kind of lament, but also it's a prayer for his protection past fire and, and tears uh, of judgment. But um, part of its description of Columbus' activity as a, as a monk is to say, Rofes Ruov, which is to say Rome was made known that uh, irrespective of any individual uh, papal figure, any individual Pope that might or might not have appeared in his, in his dossier, um, the description of Columbus promotion of Christianity is couched in terms of Rome. Mm -hmm. Rome is shorthand for all the Christian culture and literature and, and authority of, of church decision-making bodies and all that. Um, the word Ruov is simply the, the shorthand for that great constellation of Christian values, which mm -hmm. um, Columba is seen as promoting. Mm -hmm. So while there's no direct connection to any particular Pope, mm -hmm. there is mm -hmm. an ideological connection mm -hmm. uh, and a kind of self assessment mm -hmm. as being essentially about mm -hmm 
being Roman. In amongst all of these questions, I'd also like to say there are comments coming from um, parishioners of St. Columbus thanking you for, yeah. um, <laughs> uh, for your explanations as well. Um, so I'm going to turn now to Brian James McLeod's question, which takes us back into the political world, if you like. And it says, can anything be said of the fortuitous location of Iona at the fault line of the rivaling Dalriatin and Pictish kingdoms vis-a-vis -vis Iona as a base for ambassadorial forays, ambassadorial forays? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And <laughs> it's quite possible. I mean, Adavnon does talk about uh, Columba making a trip to Skye and meeting and baptizing an elderly Pictish warrior, um, Art Brannan, his name was. Uh, so he and um, he comes to Skye where Columba is waiting on the beach, as it were, mm -hmm. and uh, Columba baptizes him. And there's a well, still a holy well there on the on the island of Skye in Adamnon's time, uh, which commemorates this uh, mm -hmm. baptism. That does suggest that somewhere that line between Iona and Skye is somehow um, regarded as a kind of boundary marker, mm -hmm. and possibly that baptizing a, a Pictish war leader, um, he's the primarius cohortis, he's called, the, 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 the leader of a cohort. Mm -hmm. Interesting language to apply to, to a Pictish war band. You know, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a biblical Latin term apart mm -hmm. from anything else. So um, yes, I, th I think there may be something about that. We we do have Columba crossing the other, the principal boundary, because the centers of Pictish power and wealth and control were actually on the on the east side mm -hmm. of the country. Mm -hmm. So even if we think of Skye as being Pictish, it's a pretty marginal part of Pictland. Mm -hmm. But the water between Iona and Skye would have been in that sense, therefore, a kind of a boundary. The most significant boundary was the the Massif Central of Scotland, mm -hmm. the Tramalpin, the great ridge of mountains between the east and the west. And we have lots of stories about Columba crossing that boundary and encountering and confronting to some extent um, the Pictish elite on the east side of Scotland. Mm -hmm. Can I take you back to the question that we were looking at before um, uh, uh, about St Ninian and the Bishops of York? The beginnings of the question um, was, to what extent was the shift from Govan and Constantine to Glasgow and St Mungo about the ecclesiastical independence from England? Ah, uh, right. And that brings in the York thing. Mm -hmm. I really don't know about that. There's, there's very little... It would require a, a closer reading, I think, of the mm -hmm. contemporary um, contemporary ecclesiastical documents. Um, it's interesting at that time, at the time this, this, uh, st these stories of Kentigern were written, mm -hmm. Whithorn was uh, a sea in a sea belonging to York, but all the other dioceses of Scotland mm -hmm. were at least in theory, <laughs> uh, proclaimed themselves to be mm -hmm. Scottish dioceses. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And the, that's the, the importance of St. Andrews in that, in that scheme. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's this, this campaign to have Glasgow recognized as the filia specialis, the special mm -hmm. daughter of the papacy, giving mm -hmm. it further strength and independence from mm -hmm. any Yorkish mm -hmm. claims. Mm -hmm. I don't see entirely how the move from Govan to Glasgow would have particularly affected mm -hmm. Cumbria's relationship with York. Mm -hmm. um, it may mm -hmm. be that by creating Glasgow mm -hmm. as, a, as mm -hmm. a major diocese and suppressing mm -hmm. Govan mm -hmm. and attaching that major diocese to the mm -hmm. Kings of Scots, mm -hmm. uh, it may have given mm -hmm. Cumbria an extra mm -hmm. bit of resistant strength to York's claims, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Well, Thomas has, I'm, 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 I'm coming in on his behalf here. And um, thanks for the clarification. Thanks, uh, thanks you for the clarification for that. Um, do we have any, if we have no more further questions, 
what I would like to do is do some thanks just now, Gilbert, with your permission. Lovely, yeah. I'd like to, um, on behalf of um, uh, St Mungo's Trust, um, on behalf of the St Mungo's Festival and the Medieval Glasgow Trustees, I would like to thank you for that fascinating lecture that put into political context um, uh, at this such an important point in time for um, St Columba for his um, 1,500 year anniversary of his birth and I hope it will be followed up with many more events this year. On behalf of the trustees I'd also like to thank everybody um, for coming uh, tonight but also I'd like to stress that we have this talk, this lecture and the other events of the festival available on the St Mungo's Festival 2022 website um, and they'll be there indefinitely so you can go on to the site, you can um, uh, and, and click watch any of the events and it is really fascinating actually when we put your lecture um, alongside Dr John Davis's lecture for the development of Mungo and actually it really builds up such a fascinating picture of the ecclesiastical and political history at the time. Um, it, that leaves me to do some other more general thanks. I'd particularly like to thank my fellow trustees um, for organising this festival. And again, for Colin Hughes and Prasad Borkar, who have done so much in making sure that the festival takes place this year. Um, you can see, um, if you go on to um, www.stmungo's stmungofestival.co.uk and um, you can get all the events that have taken place. I'd also like to thank some other people that have contributed to the festival over the last week and a half, in particular Glasgow Life and Dr Aidan O'Brien. Our other speakers, Dr John Davis, Thomas Joshua Cooper, Catherine Mooney um, and uh, Mark Johnson, Dr Gordon Wiley, and finally, of course, yourself, <laughs> um, and uh, I'm sorry, the Strathclyde Chamber of Choir as well. Um, I would like to end by promoting, if I can, a, a publication that um, uh, is part of the, it comes from the Friends of Glasgow Cathedral, which you can see on the screen. Um, as I speak, where, immortal, where mortal and immortal meet. And this book of essays uh, marks the 85th anniversary of the foundation of the Friends of Glasgow Cathedral by Reverend A. Neville Davidson. Um, this book has just been published. It's entitled Where Mortal and Immortal Meet, edited by Dr. Andrew J. Ralston. So part one of the book traces the history of the Society of the Friends and part two contains 16 studies by eminent historians of the past and present, covering different aspects of the development of the cathedral from the time of St Mungo up to the 20th century. Its normal RRP is £29, but copies are available for the launch for only £15, which is an absolute bargain, so I would encourage you to get on it. Um, so finally, without further ado, on behalf of Professor Stephen McKinnon, my co, um, my ass beautiful assistant for the evening, can I thank you very much for attending and hope to see you next year in person at St Mungo's Festival 2023. Thank you and good night. <laughs>